what we're going to talk today is on how we're going to work for the next classes, okay? So I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I put in our teaching material a text that you guys are going to read. This text is part of what we were going to study in uh, the classes that we're going to have. And the reason why I am I'm making this video is for to is so I can introduce to you guys a little bit of the text. What is what it is that I want you guys to see uh, inside the text? What I want you guys to notice? Okay. So first, let's talk about the fact that this text is um, made by uh, Marshall Berman. He is an urbanist and also a sociologist. He's a very strong Marxist, so he has a lot of ideas that came from Marx, and this is why it's so important for us to understand him and to understand his whole idea of... of um, liquidy that's not exactly the word because that's what Bauman would say but how liquid and how uh, not materialized the chain of production is and how this is so um, easy for us not to see the chain of production so um, first of all I want to show you guys how uh, connected to uh, Conclini this text is the previous text that we uh, read was by Nestor Garcia Canclini. The name of the text was Consumption is Good for Thinking. I think you guys remember that. And in that text, um, Canclini was trying to give an idea of society in Latin America. So his uh, idea was to bring an interdisciplinary methodology to understand culture and to understand consumption in Latin American countries. All right, so if we take a look at Conclini's text, one of the ideas, uh, one of the fra phrases, one of the sentences, actually a whole paragraph, what he was talking about is consumption is otherwise associated in a more radical sense with a dissatisfaction that generates an erratic flow of meanings. Erratic in the sense that it, it is always changing. Buying objects are resources for thinking one's own body, the unstable social order, and uncertain interaction with others. So to consume is to make more sense of a world where all that is solid melts into air. That is why, aside from their usefulness in expanding the market and reproducing the labor force, uh, insofar as they distinguish us from others and help us communicate with them, commodities are good for thinking. So consumption is associated with a dissatisfaction that, asso that generates an erratic flow of meanings. So there is a lot of books and psychologists and sociologists that would associate the act of constantly consuming with the act of being empty and uh, searching for different meanings in all of the products that are not inside the products, okay? And he's always talking about the fact that by buying things, you're going to be certified into a certain type of social group that will make you in a certain type of a social class. So consuming would be interesting when we're talking about Latin American uh, culture in that distinguished distinguish social classes that people are um, inside, okay? So that people are trying to get inside. So if you guys notice, there is this specific sentence when he says to consume is to make more sense of a world where all that is solid melts into air. And this is exactly the name of the uh, of Marshall Burham's book, All That Is Solid Melts Into Air. But this sentence actually comes from Marx and Engels' uh, Manifesto of the Communist Party. Okay, so the idea that uh, Marx and Engels were trying to, to show is that um, the materiality of the products and of the chain of production, which is what we are 
what is which is what we're studying today. So the chain of production is completely emptied. It, 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 it melts into air. So the materiality, the real materiality of the products of history is completely erased in this constant search of consuming. Constant revolutionizing of production, uninterrupted disturbance of all social conditions, which has a lot to do with what uh, Conklini was talking about, the fact that you start consuming in an erratic way, in an erratic search for meanings inside a social class. Everlasting uncertainty and agitation distinguish the bourgeois epoch from the earlier ones. All fixed, fast-frozen relations with their train of ancient and vulnerable prejudices and opinions are swept away, all new formed ones become antiquated before they can ossify. So what he's saying is that the velocity, the speed of the relations and the search for meanings are so huge that we forget that, not that we forget, that uh, deliberately the chain of production is erased inside the symbolic system of society. So he continues, all that is solid melts into air, all that is holy is profaned, and man is at last compelled to face with sober senses his real conditions of life and his relations with his kind. So when he says all that is solid melts into air, he's talking about this materiality, this chain of production that is completely erased from society. So we don't even know exactly what mankind does, what we are actually doing when we are working, when we are consuming. We have no idea where the, these products come from. We have no idea how they are produced. We have no idea what reproduction of labor force means. This is what he's trying to say. So, the need of a constantly expanding market for its products chases the bourgeoisie over the entire surface of the globe. It must nestle everywhere, settle everywhere, establish connections everywhere. This is very interesting for us to understand the part or the role of social media and also the mass media means of communication, mass media and, for example, such as, for example, uh, TV, radio, and many other kinds of means of communication, and how they work with advertisement to exactly erase this type of chain of production. Okay, and this is why I want you guys to read Marshall Berman's book, which is, as I said, All That Is Solid uh, Melts Into Air, The Experience of Modernity. But for you guys to understand a little bit more about this text, uh, you guys are going to have the introduction and the chapter that I uh, chose for you guys to read, which is in our teaching material there on the Blackboard um, platform. But there is something that I want to show you guys, okay? First of all, <clears throat> for those who don't... Uh, who are not very familiar with the concept of modernity and the difference uh, between the the, the, te the term modernity and modernism, I would like to show you guys the differences between these two terms, okay? So, uh, modernity is a political and social understanding of the modern period, okay? And starts, which starts during, from, during the French Revolution and continues until something around 1960, 1980s, okay? This is not very accurate. Some uh, authors would say that um, modernity would start with the Industrial Revolution, the first Industrial Revolution, and others would say the beginning of the bourgeoisie, okay? So beginning of the society itself, right? And modernity would also have this idea of extreme progress. If you guys take a look at the chapter and the introduction, actually, that I uh, left there for you guys to read, he's going to talk about Brasilia, which is the federal district here in Brazil, and how it was created by uh, Oscar Niemeyer. And um, he was very mod he was a modernist, but he and he was in this idea of progress, but he wouldn't understand what progress would mean in terms of political understanding. 
On the other hand, modernism would be a term that we would associate with the movement, the artistic movement that takes place around the same time of modernity, but it is focused on the ruptures with tradition, basically with monarchy. But it would also have a critical point of view with this sense of progress and modernity. So modernism would be the same, it would be a contemporary, a contemporary uh, movement with modernity, in terms that they are both contemporary, but um, they would criticize the idea of progress and enlightenment that would happen during modernity, okay? So, uh, while modernity is talking a little bit about the idea of progress, enlightenment, and science as a way of finding truth, so the enlightenment would be when religion would be discarded in the sense of it does not explain the truth, and science would be the one that would explain the truth, Modernism would contest the idea of truth. It wouldn't contest the idea exactly of science, but it would contest the idea of having a specific real truth or a unique uh, paradigm that would explain the whole universe. So what modernism would do would be criticizing this idea. There is another um, term that I would like to distinguish from modernity, which is postmodernity. And you guys are probably going to uh, see that term on the book, okay, inside the book. So, modernity would be, as I said, a, uh, it would be a political and social understanding of the modern period. And another thing that is very important for you guys to understand is that modernity would have a liberal paradigm inside the capitalist regime, okay? So what we would have would be huge industries, this idea of progress would be the idea of uh, creating the same car for everyone because we didn't have a lot of technology to create different cars. We would be able to have only mass communication media. We would be able to have a unique paradigm to explain the whole universe, as I said before. But postmodernity would be a political and social understanding of our current times. The term is problematic due to its relation with modernity, because postmodernity would mean something like we are not inside modernity ever, anymore, but at the same time, postmodernity means there are still some reflexes of modernity inside our social understanding now, inside our society, inside our culture. So we have not overcome modernity. So we are in this area, in this gray area that we don't exactly understand in the sense that there are a lot of paradigms still going on, such as religion, the school, political views, and ideology, but at the same time, they don't function the same way they used to function. So this is the idea that we're working with, okay? So in modernity, for example, would, you would have a one way to see family, which, which would be a very traditional family. In postmodernity, you would still have this type of family, like a man and a woman having two kids, but you would also have different types of families. That would, um, what would happen is you would have uh, to accept different kinds of families, for example, and yet you would have another group that wouldn't accept this kind of families. So you have this conflict of paradigms working all together inside this person postmodern condition. What we would have in capitalism would be a neoliberal perspective. So you would have social media working, you would have macro, uh, micro entrepreneurs, you would have macro business and micro business working at the same time. You wouldn't have exactly a truth that would work for everyone, you wouldn't have only just one type of information that would come from TV, you would have lots of people uh, creating different types of information on social media. That would be what we are talking about, what we're talking about, which is postmodernity. And this is very important for you to understand because this, instead of looking of the real chain of production of all products and of all objects in our society, it's making it 
even more melted, it's making it even more liquid because we're changing ideas all of the time and we're not looking for the materialities of history, okay? That, that's what uh, Marshall Berman and that's what Conclini would talk about, the idea of postmodernity. This liquid idea and this constant search for meaning in life, even if that meaning search for meaning would mean erasing all of the real, all of the reality of humankind. So, as I said, the structures, even science, are being dismantled, and what we are having now is what they're calling the post-truth, which would be not only understanding that there is not a, a unique explanation for the whole universe, that there might be other explanations, but also a very dangerous moment for the denial of science, as we have um, a lot of criticism towards President Trump, for example, who is denying the concepts of science in environmental causes or in social causes in order to, uh, to um, promote a different type of economy or something that it's more that has more advantage in an economy approach.